Welcome to the Mondo Weiss Podcast. At Mondo Weiss, we cover the movements, activists, and policymakers who affect the struggle for freedom in Palestine. I'm Dave Reed. In this episode, we'll hear a conversation with author Zaina Arafat. Her new novel, You Exist Too Much, has garnered widespread acclaim and was a Mondo Weiss Book Club selection. Mondo Weiss Associate Editor Allison Degger spoke to her. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this evening, we're welcoming in conversation Zaina Arafat, an LGBTQ Arab Muslim American fiction and nonfiction writer. We are pleased to discuss her debut novel tonight, You Exist Too Much, published by Catapult last year. The title was selected as the most anticipated book for 2020 by O. Oprah Magazine, Good Morning America, Vogue, L. Harper's Bazaar, Roxane Gay selected it as her favorite book of the year. Zaina's stories and essays have appeared in publications including the New York Times, Granta, The Believer, The Virginia Quarterly Review, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, The Christian Science Monitor, BuzzFeed Vice, Guernica, Literary Hub, and NPR. Zaina is a professor at Long Island University. She holds an MA in International Affairs from Columbia University and an MFA from Iowa, where she's also taught writing. She has additionally instructed at the School of the New York Times, the International Writing Program, and Sackett Street Writers, and at venues abroad, including Jordan, Egypt, and Eritrea, where she taught creative writing as part of a U.S. State Department International Writing Program delegation. She grew up between Washington, D.C. and Jordan, both locations that feature prominently in You Exist Too Much. She lives in Brooklyn and is currently at work on a collection of essays. For those of you who may be interested in instruction from Zena, she will be joining the faculty at Tin House for their online summer workshop this July, and we'll be, we'll be providing the link to the chat in this event. And if you all want to take a look at the chat now, you can see that we have a link over where you can purchase her book from our partner, Middle East Books and More, located in Washington, D.C. in DuPont. Circle. If you're in the local area, please stop by and say hello to them and pick up a book. Um, before we get started and jump over to Sina, a little bit about the book, told in vignettes that flash between the United States and the Middle East, from New York, Jordan, Lebanon, and Palestine, you exist too much, traces an unnamed protagonist's pros- progress from blushing teen to sought-after DJ and aspiring writer. In Brooklyn, she moves into an apartment with her first serious girlfriend and tries to content herself with their comfortable relationship. But soon her longings, so closely hidden during her teenage years, explode out into reckless romantic encounters and obsessions with other people. Her desires to thwart her own destructive impulses will eventually lead her to the ledge, an unconventional treatment center that identifies her affliction as love addiction. In this strange and closed society, she will start to consider the unnerving similarities between her own internal dramas and divisions and those of the places that have formed her. So with that, I would like to say uh, welcome to Zaina and please uh, take it away. Hi, um, thank you so much for that lovely introduction and it's lovely to be here and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, So I guess I'll start by reading from the novel. I'm just going to read the opening pages of the book, so you don't need to know anything in advance. In Bethlehem, when I was 12, men in airy white gowns sat at a three-legged table outside the Church of the Nativity. They ran prayer beads through their fingers and sipped mint tea in gold-rimmed cups shaped like hourglasses, steam floating off the surface and up into the bright blue sky. I walked past them with my mother and my uncle as we wandered through the holy city. One of the men called out, Haram, forbidden. For the especially devout among us, it's Haram to eat meat unless the animal has been killed in a specific way. Haram to drink alcohol. Haram for a pubescent girl to expose her legs in a biblical city. It occurred to me then that I wasn't a flat-chested kid anymore, that curves had begun to appear along the length of me. I was no longer indistinguishable from a boy child. What should we do? I asked my mother. I felt a pulsing lump take shape in my throat as I noticed her teeth gritting, her jaw extended and temple temple shimmering. My great grandparents' house was where we were staying and where all of my clothes were, 36 miles and three checkpoints away. I felt myself go cold. I closed my eyes and prepared to receive her reaction. 
I knew better than to try and preempt it with an apology. All I could do was strategically try to calm myself, to remember that the anticipation was heavier than the thing itself. I should have had more sense than to dress in such a way when we were visiting the birthplace of a prophet, albeit not our own. My mother had, and still has, a native's knowledge. She knows the rules instinctively in that part of the world, and I only ever learned them by accident. Basita, said my uncle, it's okay. My mother looked me up and down. We approached the main door of the church, and the men hissed again. My uncle ran the tips of his fingers across his mustache, then looked to my mother and me. Come, he said, I have an idea. We followed him into a gift shop just off Mandra Square. He dropped a few coins on the counter, then asked the shopkeeper if we could use his bathroom. My mother grabbed a Kit Kat off the shelf and tore it open, breaking apart two sticks without a second thought. My uncle dropped three more shakels on the counter. The man pointed, pointed towards, the back, towards the back. My uncle thanked him and led the way. His master plan was that he would trade me his trousers for my Roxy surfer shorts. He went into the bathroom first, and I could hear sounds of fumbling, his belt jangling as it hit the floor. He opened the door slightly and handed his pants to my mother so she could administer the swap. She then stood in front of me while I took off my shorts. Yalla, she said, her most frequently used word. Hurry. I pulled on the pair of pants. They sagged on me. I had to tighten the belt buckle all the way up to the last hole and then roll the waist so that they wouldn't fall off, leaving me even more exposed than I had been before. I stepped out of the bathroom and looked at my uncle. I examined my new curves against his pasty legs, gangly and covered in sporadic patches of hair, my shorts tight against his thighs like boxer briefs. It occurred to me in that moment to question why, as a man, his bare legs were somehow less troubling than mine. It was a double standard, a shame I had simply accepted until then. In acquiring my gender, I had become offensive. But as I stood in front of him, an unexpected pride began to swell inside me. I liked the way his trousers made me feel, like I could get attention from boys, from girls. I felt, for once, seen. Are you a boy or a girl? A security guard at the Intercontinental Hotel in Amman had once asked my cousin Noor this question when deciding whether to lead her into the curtain-shrouded women's check for an intimate pat-down before she could enter the lobby. Binit, Noor had responded. Girl. She'd been insulted by the question, the uncertainty it revealed. But not me. Not that day. Wearing my uncle's baggy trousers, I enjoyed occupying blurred lines. Ambiguity was an unsettling yet exhilarating space. As we walked back towards the Church of the Nativity, I looked at my mother and smiled, desperate for her to smile back, but she withheld. She offered only a freshly disconcerting look, scrunching, off her, scrunching up her forehead so that lines appeared, her cheekbones protruding, her mouth forming a terrifying expression of indifference. At the time, I couldn't quite place the source of it. Had she noticed my contentment? Did it scare her? Only now, years later, do I think I understand. It was in that moment that she first realized I wasn't like her. The trousers were a demarcation line, one that separated me from my mother and her lineage. I wonder sometimes if that was, if that was the day when I began this habit of constant seeking, of endlessly striving to earn my way back, a pattern that would send me on a misguided quest for love. I communicated something to my mother as I stood there smiling in a pair of men's pants, a message I didn't know I was sending to her. She has always known first what I have yet to discover, has always seen it before I could. Look at me, I wanted to say to her then. Don't look away. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zaina. Um... So that is the the start of the book, and it's such a good example of the kind of rich lyrical descriptions you give to places that come up in the book. Um, the geography really spans uh, from Palestine, it's Bethlehem, Nablus, and then there's Amman and Iowa and Italy. And I love the delicacy through which you, you present the different uh, regions. And I was wondering, 
as you're crafting this opening scene and you were thinking about what you wanted to show, you know, it's, it's not exactly the most typical scene, like switching pants in a bathroom, but how did you kind of land that this was going to be our, our sort of foundation and formative scene that not just sets the character, but also sets the character um, in, in, in Palestine, in Bethlehem? Yeah. I mean, I think what, um, why I chose this particular scene, by the way, I close my eyes when I talk, so don't be alarmed. (laughs) I close my eyes when I think. So this scene to me encapsulated so much of what this narrator was, what this novel was going to grapple with and what this narrator's struggle was. Um, It sort of explores um, cultural in-betweenness and the sort of painful, perhaps alienating moments that come with that, which can also be really funny at times. You know, I wanted to bring some levity to that, um, to those awkward moments of the a company being in between cultures. Uh, it also takes on like gender and sexuality and that sort of in-betweenness as well. Um, you know, vis-a-vis the way that the narrator feels when wearing her uncle's pants and and it also sets up the mother daughter dynamic which is a central thread of um or just sort of like one of the sort of major through lines of the novel um is the relationship between the mother who is um an immigrant in the US and the daughter who is first generation and the sort of other you know just the dynamics of that relationship so that's why this scene and you know having it set in Bethlehem you know it's opening in Bethlehem was so important to me uh, as, you know, was so important, I felt, for the book. And I also noticed you opened the book with the use of Arabic words that pepper out throughout the novel. I was wondering, when you're writing, how much do you think about, um, or how much do you decide that you're going to explain what non-English words mean to your readers, or how much do you allow them to to figure it out? So I, a lot of, I realized that as I was, you know, it's interesting, like when you're writing a book, uh, especially when it, you know, is has an international component, you have a lot of decisions to make when it comes to how much to trust the reader will get things versus wanting to sort of over wanting to explain things to the reader. It's a very like delicate balance, I think. And when it came to using the Arabic words, you know, oftentimes I I basically went with trusting the reader, meaning that like even if the reader didn't understand that word, for example, they would still get, you know, the context, they would, they would, it would, they would have be able to place it without having to understand it. And that why certain words versus others was, I felt that some words were just so, A, just like beautiful in Arabic, but also just so specific culturally and just non-translatable for me that I just wanted to leave them and trust, yeah, that the reader would be okay with that. And that if the reader knew the word, it would be like a little bonus, you know, like, oh, I know that word. I really loved um, what the mother's character that, and I I should say uh, the protagonist is not named in the book and a number of characters don't have names, but have sort of um, characteristic pseudonyms, but the mother character does have a name and a lot of the names seem quite deliberate and the mother is Leila Abu Saab. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, like, the most difficult sort of in slang, right? Is that a decent description? Yeah. Um, and I, I, I just love the section where you first really dive into her background. I feel like that really starts bringing the book towards its kind of final closing. And um, I just want to read a little bit of that for everyone. It says, um, as first ranked in her class, a distinction that still exists at the Quaker Friends School in Ramallah, Alia Abu Saab's firstborn daughter, Minister of Finance, Khaled Abu Saab's first granddaughter, and the owner of two highly pronounced cheekbones, and the first girl in the 1960s novelist to wear a London imported miniskirt, Leila Abu Saab, was certain to have a great life. And I, I just love all of the, the kind of um, detailing and the thrust around going to have a great life. And she has the name of the most difficult and a lot of hardships in her life. And I was wondering about these kind of contrast within characters and within names and how you sort of developed who gets a name and who doesn't get a name. Yeah, so in terms of like deciding exactly, like many of the characters, including the narrator, don't get a name. And so first I'll start with the decision to not name the narrator, which was, um, so the novel, you know, is called You Exist Too Much, and it's a line spoken to the narrator from the mother 
And basically, when you tell someone you exist too much, you're essentially telling them to exist less. And uh, so her not having a name and it's like a way of her existing less on the page and part of her trajectory uh, in the novel is going from a place of feeling like she should take up, sorry, ambulance, less space in the world and, you know, should make herself smaller and apologize for her existence, basically, to arriving at a place where she feels like valid in her own right to exist as she does, even if she occupies like un unacceptable spaces. Um, and, uh, and, and, and she also constantly defines herself in relation to others, which is another reason why she doesn't have a name. Like she's Layla's daughter or she's so-and-so's lover. And so the reason that some characters don't have a name is because those characters are, um, in a way it, she's objectifying those characters because she's not, you know, she, part of her struggle or her part of her struggle is that she repeats a pattern of, like sort of self-destructive relationships that are asymmetrical, that are almost just one-sided where she's sort of pouring love into people that can't love her back for various reasons. And in a way she's objectifying these people because, you know, they're not real somehow. So that's why a lot of characters don't have names and certain characters do have names and that's intentional. And, you know, the mother, also her name, as you say, like Layla, the, the impossible is basically... I mean, it was kind of a joke in a way, you know, just like she is a very difficult character. But yeah, I mean, really, it was a, mostly it was a joke like that. That last I just thought it was so funny to like call her that and so fitting that you actually make a really good point that I hadn't even thought of is just like the contrast between what her life was supposed to be and what her life sort of was, which was much more difficult than that big entrance that, you know, she gets in that chapter of like this person who's destined to have this fantastic life, but then it sort of doesn't necessarily go that way. So, yeah. The, with respect to Layla, um, when we finally get to kind of dive into her story, you make some really explicit connections between political events and how it impacted the trajectory of her life. And you'll you talk about 48 and 67, the wars and 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 what that what that meant for her and what that meant intergenerationally. But at the same time, um, you also take with the protagonist her life and almost seem to to kind of have gas lamps along the the journey of her route with political events too. It, I noticed it kind of thematically uh, related over. So when we look at these different vignettes and we're going back in time, the way that the kind of time stands or the dates are revealed are through political events or scandals. So the Intifada or Iran-Contra affair or um, Elliot Spitzer scandal, just met, you know, handedly mentioned in a, in a newspaper, New York Post, of course. And um, I was wondering what you were wanting to communicate about personal and political and the ways that are explicit with the mother, but also a little bit more softly implied with the protagonist. So essentially what was, what I, so both with these time, moments in time, these like sort of politically significant moments or just like culturally or socially significant moments, they arrive often in vignettes that are woven throughout the narrative. And that uh, I intend, I spent a long time figuring out which moments and which vignettes went where. I like printed out the whole book at one point and taped, taped the whole thing to the wall and moved the pages around because what, what I was aiming for was to show how like collective, how moments in one's either collective cultural history or one's one's actual personal history. But really I was interested in how moments in one's collective cultural history can like trickle down and impact a person without them even realizing it or just, you know, sort of subconsciously color some of their behavior. And so what will happen is like, you'll have present day text and the narrator will be in a moment behaving in a certain way. And then we'll dip out of that present moment and dip into this flashback. And it might be a flashback related to like the Intifada or Elliot Spitzer or what have you. And like, then we return to the present and the dip into the, that moment is meant to sort of shed light in some way on the present day. And like, 
why speak to how the narrator is behaving, even though the narrator isn't consciously aware or consciously processes how these moments in her cultural collective history impact her. I mean, also because like what I think is interesting is that people talk about like trickle down or not. They don't talk about, I talk about trickle down trauma. People talk about inherited trauma, but I think about it as like, what does that really mean? Is that a real thing? I think what it means is that you're raised by people that have been traumatized, right? Like, and how does that color the way they raise you? And then how does that color the way you are? Um, and so that's what I was thinking a lot about. And also things that you see, like, you know, a pa- child, a Palestinian child growing up in the U.S., for example, like they're going to see things, the Intifada through a television screen from thousands and thousands of miles away. Like, what does that do? How does that, does that really bear on them in any way? I think it does. And so I was interested in all of that. When we meet the protagonist uh, in in the ledge, uh, where she's in treatment with, I think there's four in her cohort, and they're all characters that exhibit almost like different aspects of herself, mm-hmm. and they feel really authentic and they feel really really real. Um, and I'll, you can see that she's trying to adopt the language and thought process that's in twelve step programs, and trying to kind of analyze her behavior. And she's sort of stumbling through that, and the other characters are as well too and um it, it they just seemed really really real and was there an effort to try to make them kind of unique supporting characters or were they meant to mirror aspects of herself indeed they were both like that's that's right like i really it took gosh it, that was hard to write those characters was to really sort of flesh them out and make them real people that have their own you know identity and humanity and you know the way that a character has to but they also had to either like reflect some aspect of the narrator which i think you're right to say that they all did um and i like some more than others in ways that are super unexpected to this narrator or like reveal something to the narrator about herself um and and you know initially she sort of arrives at the at at the ledge with a lot of judgment towards these other people and feeling herself to be very different from them and you know doesn't want to associate with them and then you know that sort of changes over time and it humbles her and it's intended to uh and it's also you know she's very alienated this narrator and she's you know uh she even her profession she's like a dj and being a dj is very alone uh even though you're in a packed club or something but you're up there by yourself so like she i think that in the ledge among these four these three other people she finds some form of community which is like surprising to her and an unlikely place to find it but something that she needs I I did enjoy uh, where she was a little extra judgmental and a little extra snippy. Those were kind of fun moments. Oh, good. I'm glad you did. Thank you. I know that you took about six years to write the book, but the kind of main plot was was outlined in about six months. Is is that correct? That is true. Yeah. Yeah. It all just like happened. I mean, I spent like six months just I wrote it all out and then like the next five and a half years revising and revising and revising. So. And did you start out with this structure or was that like, as you said, you were piecing it together. Was that something that you did along the way? I don't know. I don't, it's funny. I, I remember immediately when I wrote the first pages of the, actually the first pages that I read were always the first pages. And wow. when I wrote them, no, that's not true. <laughs> that's not true at all. Um, but I remember initial when I first started writing it, I started writing and then I immediately wove in a vignette. So I guess it always, it was, you know, different vignette, but like, and different starting place, but it was always going to be this, the structure that it is because I just really wanted to, I really knew that I was interested in also like associative memory as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And really exploring that, you know, question of collective cultural history and how it bears on the present and a person. Uh, there were there were a couple really harsh, sometimes even vicious statements said from the protagonist or to the protagonist. There was one in particular from the mother. Good luck finding someone to love you as I did. It's like mm-hmm. oof, that one. That one is hard. Um, when you were thinking about these sorts of, of deep cuts, like uh, how did you conceive of how they would drive the plot line forward and what they would reveal? I suppose those like, yeah, it was, it was, it's interesting. Cause like, 
another trajectory of the novel. Like there are many different uh, ways to define the trajectory, but I think one of them is like the narrator going from a place of like anger and hurt when it comes to the mother to a place of like empathy and understanding and at the same uh, empathy and compassion perhaps. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the mother going from a place of like feeling like her daughter is separate from her and doesn't belong to her to like, I don't know, accepting her. And I think that in that first trajectory of the narrator going from that place of hurt and anger, I had to sort of show what she was hurt and angry about. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I had to also humanize the mother so that we could arrive at a place of compassion and empathy. And so those like painful moments are there for that first reason, right? To show like, why is this narrator so the way she is? Like what, like what, going on there and a lot of it has to do with the mother and the mother's treatment of the narrator and and so um I had to sort of use those moments to shed light on this narrator's interiority and her psyche and her behavior and then allow them to to allow them to allow her to grip onto these moments as she moved towards like compassion and empathy and as we you know we're able to see the mother as a human uh, who has her own like traumas and her own history and her own like pain and her own what have you so yeah it was hard to write some of those like lines I would I, I just because you know me I came to care for her the narrator of course like one does and uh yeah it was those that was a oof kind of moment I agree with the the family dynamic between the mother and the daughter and the father and the daughter and the mother and the father, um, you know, it, it's it's a shattered family that mm -hmm. kind of keeps keeps interacting, keeps evolving, but it, it it's it's shattered and it's ruptured. And it made me think about like in thinking a little bit about the parents' individual backgrounds. The mother is from, you know, a more wealthy. Uh, family um, summers are spent at, with her family at the Intercontinental Intercontinental in Jordan poolside with um, waiters delivering food and the father's family is from more humble background in Nablus and I was wondering if you were thinking about representation of Palestinians and different kinds of Palestinians um, and what you were kind of encumbering upon yourself to um, to do or, or not do. You know, these are not traditional um, kinds of images that we see of Palestinians, but they, they do reflect um, real segments of society. That's exactly what I was aiming to do, was to like reflect real segments of society versus like those traditional images that one would see when one, you know, sees a Palestinian represented in media. And and, you know, I was just so much more interested in, I mean, really one of my main goals, I suppose, throughout my career as a writer has been to challenge all of those misperceptions and stereotypes and just reduced reductive images of Palestinians and what, you know, Western, mostly, I guess, Western audiences think of when they think of a Palestinian. And at the same time, I also wanted to like, you know, I didn't want to just like glorify, but like just present some I don't know what, like I wanted to actually depict a real, what I thought of as like a real segment of what, you know, Palestinian society could look like and it sort of does look like. And so that was, you know, I, I, I just, you know, they're the sort of wealthier echelons of Palestinian society. They're the less wealthy echelons, but like, and just sort of the interaction between the two and, you know, this, you know, and, and also I wanted to just sort of show the, you know, you mentioned like a shattered family, which indeed is true. And I wanted to sort of show the reality of like being a diasporic community and like what that is and what that also looks like. And I think the narrator and the family, you know, went in the scenes in the States really speak to that. So I thought that your scenes at the, the Allenby Bridge, which are kind of moments where that could be a different kind of a story that could be a political story, was a very deeply personal story reflecting on her grandmother's passing and um, the why she's acting the way that she is in relationships. And I, I really appreciated the kind of uh, dive to say this is how these things like affect your own inner emotional world. Yeah, well, thank you. Yeah, I know. I really wanted to avoid like politicizing things in the book, but I still wanted to show like exactly like a sort of the psychology almost of the checkpoint. So, yeah. 
or the psychological impact, I suppose. So the character um, is bisexual and she has relationships with men and women that kind of seamlessly feature in the story. And it had me thinking that most of, I feel most often, you know, characters that are bisexual are either seen as a gay character or a straight character, and they have to kind of reassert themselves as being bisexual. And I was wondering, as you were writing the story, how much did you feel you needed to kind of insist who she is or just let her sort of fall into what she falls into? I mean, I never felt like I had to insist on anything when it came to, also funny enough, no, never mind. That's a side note. But I, never, I, I, I never had to insist on asserting any sort of um, like sexual orientation for her. Like I felt, felt, I felt as though I could just sort of seamlessly move between relationships, uh, like fluidly move between like relationships with women, relationships that she has with men, and just allow that to be rather than having to assert any kind of. I don't even know if I ever used the word bisexual in the book. Maybe I do. Probably. Yeah, it's in there, I think, at least just once, though. Yeah, I, I just think, right. No, absolutely. It, it must be. But I just think that I was so, um, I wanted her to just, like, be and be messy and sort of contradictory at times and just, you know, not necessarily have, like, clear lines when it came to her sexual, her sexuality. Even, like, you know, I so I just showed her being what by I guess by being bisexual looks like rather than felt like I had to assert it or prove it or anything like that that yeah Yeah. it does it does and I appreciate that just on that end she doesn't ever question herself or her feelings on that end which is very real (laughs) and I, I I think that just as like your presentation of Palestinians felt really real your presentation of LGBTQ people felt really real when you were diving into the characters how did you kind of what were the things that you were thinking about and making them Um, more human than say like whatever their identity is I mean I just had to show a lot of scenes I guess that like just I I think just showing them outside of sometimes I meant showing like dark sides of these characters honestly like okay so like for example the narrator you know like she's an LGBTQ Palestinian American woman and like I of course there's this, there was, what I wanted to do was really three-dimensionalize what a character, what a person, you know, oh, who, and and I really wanted to three-dimensionalize those identity markers. So that meant at times like putting her in situations where she was less than, you know, where she behaved badly or something like that, right? To like really kind of transcend having to represent I think I wanted to subvert the burden of representation also if that makes sense it's like I didn't want her to have to be a spokesperson for anything or to be like wow um this is a you know I didn't want to have to bear that responsibility of like holding up an entire community Mm -hmm. um and and meaning like that she would then have to really be like on her best behavior almost all the time And so what I was so interested in with all of the characters that, you know, represent some aspect of identity or just have, you know, yeah, hail from different backgrounds or different identities. I just had to allow them to behave badly at times, you know, behave well at times, be like broken at times, be fun, like just all sort of sides of them. And, and that was really I don't know, important to me. Hard to do because like you want your characters to always be likable. But I think I had to trust that they were lovable even when they weren't always likable. When you said broken at times, it reminded me that throughout the book, there's these kind of quotes that appear that the protagonist will either run into and visually see or re-repeat to herself. And sometimes there are things that come up in recovery um, and sometimes they're... They're negative thoughts, sometimes they're positive thoughts, um, but it, I wanted to kind of jump to the, the book uh, opens with a quote from Kierkegaard, and then that also, there's a second quote from Kierkegaard that figures in about halfway through, and they're both from either or, is that correct? Yeah. 
And so the second one is desire in our age is simultaneously sinful and boring because it desires what belongs to the neighbor. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that don't have the book in front of you, the first one is pleasure disappoints possibility never. Um, I was wondering what were you, what were you hoping to kind of shift directions with or kind of set directions with, with these two quotes? Well, so that for the, okay, I'll start with the pleasure disappoints possibility never, which is, yeah, the epigraph of the novel is, I think just like, is the whole novel in a way is embodied in that quote for me, um, because it's all about, the novel is all about like anticipation versus reality. Mm -hmm. um, and then that, you know, the narrator, yeah. And then the second quote or so much of the novels about anticipation versus reality and especially in love. And, um, and so the second one desire in our age is simultaneously sinful and boring because it desires what belongs to the neighbor is also speaks to a theme in the novel of like the narrator constantly setting her sights on unattainable women and just the unattainable also on a cultural level as well of like wanting to attain her cultural heritage and belong to the middle East and, belong to her mother and these things that just feel unattainable to her. So that was um, why that quote's there as well. So yeah, those quotes both, I mean, they're really echo, meant to echo out like and encapsulate so much of the book. I, I study, I mean, the re, it's funny because the book was born of philosophy and it was initially much more steeped in it than it is, but I ended up taking a lot of it out and just leaving those two quotes. Did you see those two quotes before you started writing and they kind of inspired a lot of your direction? I think so. I'm, yeah, yeah, because I, I was a philosophy major. So probably I did see that. I mean, certainly, yeah, I was reading those Kierkegaard all the time. And I think that's, I, I actually really related to him. I watched like a biography about him the other day and I was like, man, we would have totally been friends. But um, But yeah, so I think that those quotes actually, honestly, almost engendered the book. Mm -hmm. beyond all the other stuff that I that I've experienced and wanted to explore through fiction mm -hmm. or just the world I wanted to create I guess the book has been so well received and I, I I'm not saying this to flatter you but for everyone in the on the audience you've got to the even just reading the reviews are are worth it um and I was wondering do you think that this book could have been written like 10, 15, 20 years ago, or is there sort of like uh, something in the zeitgeist right now that allows for um, narratives that are not so commonly seen in books to be so um, uh, widely accepted? I think that you're, it's, uh, I think it's of the moment in a way, because, you know, we are in an era, I think, where we're seeing more empowered female protagonists as that that also sort of take control of their sexuality and act on it and maybe also we're like there's more room for unlikable not unlikable but like female narrators that behave in ways that are traditionally considered unacceptable I would say um that are like reserved for ways that men are allowed to behave in some sense and so yeah I do think that you know I also think right now there's a lot of hunger for stories that fall outside the mainstream uh, and that aren't just like, you know, that, that are written or contain characters with marginalized backgrounds. And so I do think that maybe this book, even though I started writing this book now almost 10 years ago, I don't know that it would have had the same, um, it would have landed the same in a different era. I'm not sure. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're working on now and the kinds of themes that you're exploring in your newest essays? So I meant to say, I don't know, I actually get, this is so annoying, but I get super superstitious when I talk about what I'm working on. I just don't sleep all that night. I've learned finally after doing it like 10, like five times and being like, oh my God. Um, it's not, it's because I then can't write, but it explores a lot of the same, not a lot of the same themes. It explores totally different themes actually than are explored in the book, or maybe some themes that are like sort of there but but not as fully um what's the word realized as they will be in the essay collection but certainly there are a lot of arab and muslim characters in the essay collection so 
Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. It's a less than satisfying answer, but I want to um, take a, before we jump into some questions that are showing up on the chat and everyone, please feel free to pop some questions in there. Um, uh, I just want to ask you as kind of like a, a closer, something that I love hearing from authors. What are you reading now? What should we get our hands on? I'm reading a book by my publisher or that's by the same publisher called Fake Accounts by Lauren Euler. And um, so far I'm into it. I mean, it's about like online personas and how people live like entire lives online that are separate from their real lives. I think that one's really interesting. I'm also reading an anthology called Kinked, which is like edited by Garth Greenwell and R.O. Kwan. And it's like all this, all these stories and essays that are based around like erotica. It's really, and but like literary erotica, it's really good. So that's what I'm reading. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, reading the New York Times every day to see when this pandemic is going to end. <laughs> that, that's yeah. what I'm reading. We're yeah. almost at the, the one year anniversary. I this know. is the anniversary event of the pan pandemic. My goodness. I know. I'm real. Let's take a couple of the questions that popped up in the chat. Um, let's see. So Roberts asked, I visited Bethlehem recently, virtually courtesy of Eyewitness Palestine, and I've seen the documentary Open Bethlehem. Uh, I'm wondering if there are many scenes set there and if the haptic traffic and inevitably oppressive presence of the wall and limitations of mobility play a significant role in the narrative. No. So there are no other scenes set in Bethlehem, I don't think. And mm -hmm. honestly, I, you know, when it came to um, certainly like limitations, okay, I really did try to leave out as much of like the political context as I could. I'm not sure. I'm sh there are certainly scenes that suggest limited mobility and that speak to like tight border security. Um, and, you know, I may or may not reference the wall at some point, but uh, I didn't like expand. I, I really wanted, I mean, I think I didn't, it's so hard in this, in the U S to publish a book about like Palestine, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that I had to really be careful and sort of subversive and leave out a lot of that sort of, all of that, you know, as much as I could. But then as, as Allison mentioned, like there were those moments at the checkpoints and, you know, there are other moments that are like, you, you see flashbacks as well. There's Intifada, there's like things like that. But I tried to, for some reason, like, I really wanted to leave out contemporary, like, reality when it came to the political situation in Israel and Palestine. I think it's just, like, it was just a goal I had. Um, I wanted it also to be, like, a human story and people not to get bogged down too much, while also, of course, telling the story of a country and of, like, popular people. Um, so, yeah, it's a weird answer, but that's the answer. Um, and I, I noticed like the character has a section where she's in Cairo with her cousin and she, she accidentally buys a camel and she's kind of going off on herself or buying this camel and getting angry at herself. And she talks about how she's a tourist, but she shouldn't be a tourist. And then, um, y you know, she should go to these places and do these things, but, but she doesn't. And it kind of seemed like that was a lot of her experience in the Arab world is like, maybe she, she, she's really just doing like family stuff. Um, and uh, what an average kind of person would do who, who she is, you know, going to weddings, going to the pool, go and doing family activities. And those would kind of feature more prominently than, then politics kind of jumps in her face. She doesn't necessarily seek it out. And they, yeah. she seems to almost bubble over when she, her anger peaks and she bubbles over. That's when she kind of has a, a moment where she'll kind of start talking about um, like the anger, what anger towards her mother and politics, they kind of just zoom in together, but yeah. she, she doesn't just, she just isn't political and that's kind of who she is. Yeah, no, that's really well said. I like that. I, I liked that one because the description of the zigzag of the camel kind of collapsing down and I could kind of clicking in my head. If you all have seen a camel stand up and drop down, uh, mm -hmm. Zana captures it really well. It's, it's a little bit of a bizarre scene and they're, they just, they seem like quite like in a photograph, they seem like almost delicate creatures and they're not. No. <laughs> like, <laughs> they're so awkward and clunky and like, 
<laughs> yes, that's for sure. Uh, hi, Zaina. Uh, hi, everybody. Really, really, really great talk, uh, Allison. Um, I really enjoyed the book. Yeah, it was really good. It was a good. The unnamed protagonist is probably my new favorite Palestinian character ever written in English. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, it's it's a. Uh, I, I had a couple questions. Um, one, I want to ask about like a metaphor that I think I detected, but I'm not sure. And I just wanted to see what what you were thinking with that. Like, I felt like the mom, uh, Layla, kind of represented in a way, like the like sort of the, the political class. I know there was like class differences between her mom and dad, and uh, and I, I was wondering like, whether there was anything to that. And then with the dad, he came from more of like a falahi or a farmer, a peasant uh, family, which is the majority of, of what Palestinians were uh, before the occupation, and like. You know, they were both like uniquely unequipped to deal with like the diaspora that they ended up living. Uh, mm-hmm. And I was wondering if there's anything to that. And I, I, you know, with given respect to, I know there wasn't, this wasn't like an overtly political book. And I do, I did think it was a really good, uh, like not reductive <laughs> characters uh, that came out. And then I had one more question too, just in terms of writing, like which of the characters was the hardest for you to write? A lot, a lot of them had like really authentic voices and they felt like really real and so i just wanted to know which ones were the, were the most difficult to write uh, yeah thanks again. i'll answer both of those questions the first one i'll just, just just i'll just answer in this in this sentence which is to say that like as you said both one comes from a wealthier background the other comes from a more sort of i guess humble background Fallahi, let's say background and like they are both ill-equipped to deal with being part of the diaspora, that's for sure. And I think what I was really interested in was like how people from different socioeconomic classes handle being part of a diaspora, like re- their relationship to being immigrants. Like the mother doesn't want to be in the U.S., the father does, right? And to me, that makes perfect sense. Like the mother had a lot to lose and to leave behind. The father had only things to gain from leaving. And I think that creates a lot of the schism between them. And I think that's a really real thing to think about when you think about immigrant communities and like diasporic populations. Um, And then the second question, the easy answer is the mother was by far the hardest character to write because I had to, I mean, it was just, it was really hard to write her and also to like how much of her to put in. People always say to me, they're like, oh, we wanted more of the mother. I'm like, yeah, that's the point. You're supposed to want more of the mother. Like the narrator wants more of the mother. Everybody wants more of the mother. Like she's withholding. She's not, that is the whole point. (laughs) And and then I also like the Greg character actually in the treatment center was hard to write too, because he was such a mirror to me for this narrator. Um, But like so unseemingly and unlikely as a mirror, but he was hard to write too. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for those questions. Thank you, Hassan. Um, and then we have another uh, question. Dave, can you add in Darshan? Hi. Um, hello, Zaina. Thank Hi. you so much. This has been lovely. I, it's amazing to sort of hear your thoughts, especially as I'm like uh, uh, working my way through the book and like really enjoying the perspective that I'm getting and like sort of Actually, something that you mentioned really resonated with something that I read, one of my favorite quotes, um, where the author is like, or the um, narrator sort of just discovers, um, uh, like, or is discovering the treatment center and says, I felt myself light up. This was a real diagnosable condition. It was a designation that abstracted my obsessions from all contexts and almost sanctified them while obscuring their actual source. Huh. Um, I really love that. Like the, the idea that like, um, uh, we're sort of offered these solutions that are, that are really abstracted from like the realities of our experiences. And it tied into what you were saying about trickle down trauma versus, um, in like inherited trauma. And I wonder if you could speak to maybe the limitations of like viewing all, trauma through some kind of overarching lens, like you can describe all diasporic traumas um, inherited um, versus the more narrative approach that you take? I mean, I think you just said it, right? The answer, which is exactly that. Like you cannot have some overarching lens through which to describe all diasporic trauma. You have to write a whole book to explore like one person's diasporic trauma, which was, I love that you read that line because it's funny. It's been a long time, of course, since I've read the book. And I remember 
that line, I love writing that line and, and wording that line because I, I feel like that was um, such a point that I wanted to communicate, right? was like, you know, you, can, you can't just abstract the um, outcome from the source. And, and by the way, that speaks to politics as well and specifically Palestinian like politics. And, um, and so I just, yeah, I mean, that's exactly the answer is like, no, you, you can't do that and have some overarching lens or even some diagnosis or like, and, and all these cliches that people use and I'm like, well, what does it mean? Like what, yeah. Like what does inherited trauma mean? Like how does one inherit trauma? What is that? And I really wanted to kind of explore all of that. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll just kind of wrap it up from here. Thank you so much, Zaina. Um, it was really, really a, a great read. It was kind of like once I started, it was like, hold on, uh, we're we're gonna go for a ride. <laughs> it's gonna be. <laughs> The rocky ride. Uh, I want to just kind of hold up the book for the camera because Sally's got it up, um, waving it. Thank you for getting the book, Sally. Uh, if you guys haven't purchased it yet, I'm going to repost the link for buying it from our partner, Middle East Books and More, Washington, D.C. Best deal in town because they do uh, $2 media mail shipping. So there you go. And you can support the U.S. Post Office that way. Thank you. So I'll just kind of wrap it up. So thank you again, Dana, um, Katie from K uh, Catapult, Dave, and the entire Mondo Wise Book Club. We're so glad to have the ability to meet virtually. Like the content on our website, this event was free of charge, but that doesn't mean that it was free of cost. Please consider becoming a monthly sustainer to our site so that we can continue to bring you independent news analysis and discussions like this. If you're a current donor, we sincerely thank you. This club and our site could not function without your support. And I, I mean that, I mean, this is an independent outlet and we really are dependent upon your generosity. Um, if you're not able to donate at that time, we still value your engagement as a reader, social media follower and subscriber, subscriber to our many newsletters and our podcast. So we'll have links for all those that you can check out, get more content. Um, and at this time, I'd also like to announce our next book club pick. We're going to be reading Children of the Ghetto, My Name is Adam by Elias Hurry from Archipelago Books. Um, and that's it. Um, thank you again, Zaina, and hang on everyone for the links. Um, and I just say thank you, Allison, for such a lovely conversation and such unbelievably thoughtful and thought-provoking questions. Really, they were great. And um, thank you all for being here. I really, really enjoyed this and for reading. It's really um, it's nice to be feel like part of a community right now when you're um, in the middle of this, you know, these times. So thank you. Thanks for listening to our show, a production of MondoWise.net. The music you heard is from Sound of Picture. Visit our site to join the Mondo Weiss Book Club, a go-at-your-own-pace reading club exploring new and contemporary Palestinian fiction. You can also sign up to get new headlines about Israel, Palestine, and related U.S. politics delivered directly to your inbox. If you'd like to support our work, go to mondoweiss.net slash donate. Mondo Weiss is a nonprofit publication, and every donation helps sustain our work. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen, and please leave a rating and review to help others find our show.